Hey, hello everybody. It's Sherry with the CGH Health Foundation and welcome to our weekly program. Today's one of our Growing Healthier programs when we feature providers talking about important health topics. And this month, March, is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So we have invited Dr. Amen Alzubi um, to come and talk with Dr. Bird about colorectal cancer. And the awareness part is that uh, even though uh, colorectal cancer rates have been declining, they have been rising in younger adults. So today, Dr. Bird's going to talk to Dr. Ozubi about new screening guidelines and preventive measures so that you can practice so you can reduce your risk for this disease. Before I turn it over to Dr. Bird, I want to tell you about our other upcoming Growing Healthier programs for April, May, and June. In April, it's Autism Awareness Month. So on the 21st of April, we will have two of our excellent pediatric speech language pathologists, uh, Erica Smith and Laura Melville, uh, discussing how to spot autism in early childhood and the types of therapies that we can do um, for those children at CGH, CGH Pediatric Rehab. And then on May 12th, uh, Dr. Preeti Joseph from the CGH Neurology Department is going to talk about the signs, symptoms, and treatment of stroke um, and the latest therapies and treatments to help a stroke victim recover. Um, on June 23rd, uh, Dr. Young Song uh, from Urology is going to focus on men's and women's sexual health. So you can put those dates on your calendar. And remember, although our programs are delivered via Facebook, we do record all of them. And you can find the recordings um, on the CGH Health Foundation. Just click on the menu and look for the link for YouTube and radio in interviews. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Bird. Thanks, Sherry. Hey, Sherry. There she is. Hey, I wonder how many people actually use real calendar calendars these days. I still use one. You do? Oh, you're yes. old, you're old cool. <laughs> yep. I, I, I have used three calendars, I guess. You use what? Three? I use three different calendars. <laughs> well, you're very efficient then, aren't you? Well, or just you know anxiety ridden. <laughs> 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 All right, Sherry. Well, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Good to have you on. All right. So, oh, <laughs> there's an app for that. Thanks, Matt. All right. So uh, good to have you all here. Welcome uh, to Facebook Live CGH. This is Dr. Bill Bird, Chief Medical Officer here at CGH. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I completely forgot. Obviously, here I am with nothing green on. But anyhow, for those of you who are so inclined, happy St. Patrick's Day. So today... Sherry mentioned we're going to talk colon cancer and some guidelines for that. Um, however, we're also going to talk some other colon health type of questions with Dr. Al Zubi. So looking forward to having him on. And then when we get done uh, with that conversation, I'll give you a brief update related to COVID pandemic type of stuff. So that's the outline. Let's get Dr. Al Zubi on. Hi, Dr. Al Zubi. Hi, Dr. Bird. How are you? Welcome. This, you said this is, your you. First, this is your first crack at doing a, a, an interview like this, right? Correct, yes. All right, all right. So audience, be nice to them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so we t we're going to talk colon stuff, particularly mm -hmm. colon cancer. But I do have some other questions kind of around that that I know that you're knowledgeable on that I thought our audience would be interested in. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start rattling off some questions and have you kind of begin to help us understand them better. Are you ready? Yes. All yes. right. So the first one is something about, we hear more and more information about our microbiome, which is kind of like the, the bacteria that we have in our, in our colons, in our gut, mm -hmm. and how that affects our overall health. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about this topic, Dr. Alzubi? Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it your invitation and CGH's invitation. It's actually a very uh, uh, big topic, and uh, but I would like to try as, as best as I can illustrate the uh, importance of a healthy gut, uh, which is what the gut microbiota or microflora is all about. There are essentially trillions of fungi and bacteria and viruses that live with us and they're so diversified and um, 
crucial to the health, not just the gut health, but the human body, from the brain to the to the gut to the immune system. Uh, it's just such a how can I say? It, it's such a crucial part of your body. Um, like they say, uh, listen to your gut. Your gut depends on you, and the microbiome is asking for your help as a patient. So um, it's so it's so important to maintain that healthy, diversified uh, microbiome, or in, g in general terms, your gut flora, your, which sure. you know, gives sure. you, lives with you. Any recommendations on what folks would do to try to make sure that their the composition of their gut bacteria and everything else is as healthy as possible? Wonderful. Good question. F folks should know that in addition to listening to your gut, uh, the importance of the gut flora is not just taking in the nutrients and converting th them to crucial uh, building blocks, if you will, or uh, it's just the way the the uh, the the, uh, the they are composed of is is crucial to uh, preventing disease in general, not just gut disease, but we're talking about you know things like Alzheimer's disease, things like autoimmune disease, um, diabetes. It's so crucial to maintain that. So. I'll give an example. You you eat things that you think, yeah, I eat that every day. What the what's the big deal if I don't eat that and eat you know less healthy, uh, high high in fat, high in carbs. You know, it's 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 what if you are what you eat. Yeah. Maintaining the diversity depends on on the patient and what he eats. Yeah. Do, do you recommend that folks take uh, like over the counter probiotics? For sure, no question. Okay. Um, be, because, so, yes, eating healthy, uh, healthy diet and natural probiotics is needed, but sometimes we're, we're all busy. We may not have the enough time, or you know, <laughs> sometimes some of us eat just once a day. So pre and probiotics over the counter is really a very good habit. All of us should be. Doing. Okay. Um, good. Um, I am going to transition into colon cancer, which was our topic. So what are the latest screening recommendations as far as colon cancer goes, Dr. Uh, well, That's a, a great question, and thank you for asking that. I'm just going to be looking at some of my notes here. A recent paper that came, uh, and it was approved by the, the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force. It, it consists of uh, not just one GI society, but the three main GI societies, and the um, basically the recommendations are endorsed by the uh, American Cancer Society is to lower the age of screening for colon cancer from 50 to 45 for all patients who are at average risk for colon cancer. We're talking about patients who have no family history, no no history of GI disease, no history of any issues that put, okay. could put them at risk for colon cancer, average risk or low risk for colon cancer. So the new number is 45. Yes. 45 is the new 50. That's exactly <laughs> right? true. Our 50, whatever, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this. How about for people who, um, don't ha who do have a family history? What are the recommendations for screening for them? In a family history, especially first degree relatives and younger than 60, we would say start 10 years before your, your family member. So say he was, your, your, your mother or father had colon cancer at, at 50, you start at, at, at 40. Okay. Uh, that's a general kind of an old, uh, but it has, has survived many, many generations and I would say studies. 10 years before the youngest uh, okay. family member with colon right. cancer. Right, good, okay. So if you're 
obviously you want to do the screening because that's really helpful to, to catch. It's one of the cancers you can actually catch before it becomes cancer and not get colon cancer. So it's one of those screening tests. It's very, very useful, very valuable. You know, you, you don't want to get the polyps in the first place that become cancer. Are, is there, are there any dietary recommendations, um, anything that we know from, you know, from research over the years of things that we should or should not eat to try to reduce our risk of colon cancer? Definitely. Uh, I would say cut on the bread, meat and processed meats, uh, things we love and we eat every day. Uh, but I'll, I'll make it quick. One hot dog a day, which is 50 grams of processed uh, animal-based you know, meat, uh, puts you at risk for colon cancer at an early age. So uh, less, less red meat, less processed meat, um, and uh, obviously maintaining a healthy uh, diet and, and, uh, and weight, exercise. Uh, there are the diet and exercise, just living healthy and mm -hmm. loving your gut would lower your risk of colon cancer. Okay. Yeah. Good. And more fiber. Right. Uh, vegetable based, but obviously that's, you know, it's needed. Yeah. Well. So the less red meat uh, you can have, the better in terms of your, your colon cancer risk. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I was going to ask too, are there, I think there have been studies done regarding certain medications that could potentially reduce the risk of Correct. colon cancer. What, what's the latest on that? It's a so-called chemo prevention, uh, to not to get caught these tiny things we call polyps in the first place. So yes, diet and living healthy and maintaining, you know, an optimal weight, but also studies have shown that the use of uh, aspirin. So we could say you could hit two birds with one stone, maybe help the cardiac health and also help your core health as well, with yeah. baby aspirin. And I know though that that's controversial because obviously aspirin seems pretty, uh, like pretty benign to take, Correct. but there are ble bleeding yes. risks in particular for folks you who are- baby aspirin, yeah. Yeah, so I, from, what I've, from what I've heard is once again, it's probably a conversation with your doctor about what are your risks of heart disease versus colon cancer and talking that through about whether or not aspirin could potentially be helpful for you. Baby aspirin that is. Most definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> I, that's a good question. So what would you say for that question, Dr. Alzubi? Yes. There is something called SUDAB. And uh, it is it's been approved. Uh, uh, S, S as in Sam, U as in umbrella, T as in Tom, A, B, SUTAP. And uh, I think it's, it has promising uh, data from the uh, lead author. Uh, and actually, he's considered one of the fathers of colonoscopy in the States uh, out of Indiana University. He has done uh, the legwork, if you will, with the efficacy of uh, this pill called SUTAP. Okay. So yes, that's really great news for our patients. And is that ready for prime time or do we have it correct. right now? Correct, it is. It is okay. ready. Okay. It is ready. okay. I, I know I had I had a colonoscopy um, probably three or four months ago, which by the way, our marketing department wanted to film, but I wasn't real excited about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, um, then the prep that I did, because I had to do, it was a repeat one. And the prep I had to do this time was um, Miralax. So I put the Miralax in, I think it was like in Gatorade. And wow, that was a lot better than when I had done a mag citrate prep a few years before that. So I, even that is better than what I experienced in the, the past. Previous one. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We are working on that topic because patients think that it's not actually the procedure. It's just the day before oh, yeah, yeah. and the prep. Right. It's all, it's it, once, once I show up to the GI department, that your team and the docs and everybody, and you get your happy juice and everything's good. It's just yeah. that it's just the day before that. Yeah. So that was a good question. I appreciate that, Julie. Yeah. Okay. Let me move on to another question that's related to, to your colon. 
And then as I know as a primary care doc, this was a common question or thing that popped up and that was, what is a normal bowel pattern? I like the, the rule of three, the rule of three. It could vary from three bowel movements a day to three having a bowel movement three times a week. If we, that's kind of a, I would say applies to most uh, folks who, you know, who, who want to know what is normal for me? Uh, what is normal for a human being? Uh, so having a bowel movement every day obviously is good, but it, it really varies. That's a pretty broad range. You know, we're talking three a day to three a week. So that, yeah. Yeah. and so it sounds, like, it sounds like as long as that person kind of has a, re their routine is, the, is whatever it is and it doesn't change a whole lot, that's okay. That's a crucial statement is uh, maintaining your pattern and there's no change in the pattern. Okay. So let's say your pattern has changed or you tend to run uh, towards the constipation side of things. Um, what are the, what, from your perspective, are the non-medicinal and medicinal steps that you recommend for folks who have that, that tendency towards constipation? Yeah, especially in younger patients who are active and, you know, they want to start with some simple remedies. I would, I would look at the diet first, stress level, um, and start with simple measures like pre and probiotics. Especially if they say we have no alarming symptoms. In other words, no pain, no weight loss, no appetite changes, no blood, you know, blood in the stools, or black stools or dark stools. So these are, you know, you could say you're kind of an occasion of constipation. Uh, these are younger patients who have no risks and they are doing okay, no, no, no high risk uh, stigmata. So th these are the patients that we tend to manage conservatively, like you mentioned, with medicinal uh, and, and digestive supplements, which is pre probiotics and uh, a common laxative available over the counter uh, called Merlax. Uh, it's very safe. P patients think it's uh, addictive. No, it is not addictive as other laxatives. You could use, you could use it for occasion, occasional constipation without the notion that you're going to be hooked up to Merlax. Yeah, very good. And that's, that's been in my career that that became available. So it's, it's a, it's a product that I see you all use a lot. Primary care uses a lot too, is the Miralax product. So, yeah. Yeah. okay. Um, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> so <laughs> diarrhea, yeah. uh, particularly for folks um, who have sudden onset diarrhea, you know, it happens. Um, what are your guys, what would you say would be the time that those folks who have sudden onset of diarrhea, that they should seek medical care versus just kind of hanging out at home and writing it out? Uh, primarily if they have, you know, protracted duration, more than two days, and now they're getting dehydrated, their skin looks dry, their eyes are sunken, they're weak, they're lightheaded, they're dizzy. These are signs of dehydration that probably just staying home and doing oral rehydration may not be enough. And patients have to be seen uh, at a how about, higher... How about blood in the stool? Is that a sign that you need to seek medical care or... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. These are alarming, what we call alarming symptoms. Bloody, that loose stools with cramping that the patient is having and is protracted over two days. These are bad. These are signs that the patients need to watch for. Yes. Okay. How about chronic diarrhea? Oh, let's see what Carrie's office, but the stomach flu going around. Just wondering, since I'm sick with, well, sorry to hear that, Carrie. Uh, are, Dr. Alzubi, are you, what do you hear? Are you, is there stomach flu going around lately that you're aware of? Well, it's the season, uh, but fortunately we're going into the warmer sea. You know, it's the same as a viral gastroenteritis. And usually they're self-limited -lim course, uh, but uh, yes, I, I did see some some cases lately. And usually the treatment is very conservative. It's just like yeah. you're having uh, uh, the usual kind of flu. 
hydration and right, right. give your bowels a little bit of rest from bland yeah. diet. Yeah. Yeah, Carrie, I'll try my crack at that question too. I, I wouldn't say that we're in pandemic levels of uh, stomach bugs, of people having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea type of symptoms, but I'm definitely hearing it here and there, um, whether that be people that, are, that can't come to work because they're having some issues or that type of thing. So yeah. there's a little bit of that going around the community. And actually the good news on that kind of infection, we don't want to get it in the first place, but you actually, for most of the time for that infection, it typically is a hand, mouth, type of situation in terms of how you get it. Right. So if, you, if you're pretty diligent during, if there's a little run of it going on in the community, if you're pretty diligent about hand washing and um, those type of things and not touching your nose a lot or putting your fingers in your mouth, um, you can quite a bit reduce your risk of getting that. Yeah. I'm gonna move on to chronic diarrhea. So when is diarrhea considered chronic and then, um, when would you recommend to come and see uh, a physician regarding that? Yeah, it's usually duration more than four weeks. Uh, and at, the, at that point, patients are saying, uh, I need to seek medical attention because I'm, I'm not accustomed to having something more than four weeks. Um, and uh, I think all of those cases need to be evaluated in the GI clinic. Okay regardless of the absence or presence of alarming symptoms, such as blood or pain, weight loss, all of them need to be, because sometimes it's, it's a simple uh, review of their medications uh, or, you know, some something simple that we could discuss during the visit. Uh, it doesn't equal that you're going to get, you know, more invasive testing. It could be just as simple as reviewing your medication list and consulting with other doctors are prescribing these medications. Good, good. Uh, one other uh, colon related question. It's something that many of our, our viewers probably have heard of. Uh, it causes diarrhea too. It's called Clostridium difficile or C. diff, as we right. know it in, in a lot in the medical community. Made a lot of news. Um, it gets people really sick at times and it can be really hard to get rid of. <laughs> so. Right. What causes C. diff and what can people do to keep from getting that infection, Dr. al -Zubi? Like we said in the beginning, you are what you eat and, you know, helping your gut microbiome stay healthy and diversified is the best way to avoid C. diff. It lives with us. This bug is one of the uh, uh, bacterial organisms that live with us and stay with us. Um, now, when there's an imbalance because of a, of a weakened gut microbiome, example, taken antibiotics, uh, that's when they get released and cause uh, the symptoms and, uh, and the trouble we have. And sometimes, like other patients know, it could be recur you know, recurring infection. It's, 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 it's with us, and it's like a super bug. We did not help uh, ourselves by not eating healthy, and taking too much antibiotics. And, uh, so it's, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds, like, okay, I'm, I'm going to eat healthy, I'm going to get C. diff, but that's one of the things, is maintaining a healthy microbiome to keep C. diff in its tracks and never as escalate to the degree of colitis caused by C. diff. Right. So it's, it's, yeah. So it's simple things like hand washing and eating, eating healthy. I, I'm right. glad you mentioned the antibiotics part of things because I don't, we haven't talked about that a lot here on the show because we've dealt with more of our pandemic related things, but not every case, but there definitely are a good number of cases of C. diff that relate back to someone who took antibiotics for a condition. Correct. Whether that be they thought they had a, there was a sinus infection or a bladder infection or all those kind of things. And I think it's one of those under thought of issues when at times um, we prescribe antibiotics and, and for sure for the, the patients who receive them, it's probably not front and center in their minds, but it's all the more reason, and I'm editorializing a little bit here, but it's all yeah. the more reason 
that you know we we that we want to use antibiotics, but there are going to be times when your when your physician or nurse practitioner or physician assistant is going to say, you know, I don't think what you have needs antibiotics. Right. And part of the reason that they say that is, well, they're going to treat you if you have something that they're convinced, but if you don't, it, there's a risk of getting C. diff if you go on antibiotics. So that's yeah. part of the equation, as well as part of the equation is there's resistance more and more to antibiotics. So you don't want to use them just to use them either. So I, I'm glad, Dr. Alzuba, you brought up the antibiotic part of this. And I just wanted the folks who are listening in just to hear that because it is part of the decision making about whether uh, antibiotics are a good fit for whatever condition you're you're considering it for. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I want to. I want to. Um, Pam wanted to know: Can uh, can irritable bowel syndrome alternate between diarrhea and constipation? Absolutely, it's a mixed uh, picture with between both. It's called IBS dash M as in Mary as opposed to IBS dash C as in constipation or D. So definitely it is a mixture of both. Any thoughts on, you know, I, I'm sure that I, I forget who was, who sent that into us, Matt, who was that Pam? Was that right? Pam? Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, oh, I know. I know. Hi, Pam. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so Pam's asking about that. Are any, any thoughts? I'm sure Pam probably has, has different things that she tries, but any ideas on little tricks to try to, reduce that going back and forth and having more steady bowels with if you have IBS? Uh, of course, if, if the, the workup has been done when we have excluded all organic reasons, and we know for sure this is a functional bowel disease, uh, which is IBS, yes, we have options to mitigate the fluctuation between both. And I will go to the beginning of the discussion. A healthy Microbiome is one really big thing that helps those IBS patients. Uh, stress. Even a 15 a 15 minute walk a day. You don't have to go to the gym every day, but just around your house, 15 minutes can have tremendous benefits on your gut microbiome. So it's not just your diet, but you know other simple things you could do. Yeah, good. And of course, we're talking about medicinal treatments. Right. That could be discussed during a GI visit. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, I'll take any other viewer questions still, but I, I wanted to switch it to a personal note. Um, Dr. Azubi, for those of you who don't know, has been here with CGH for, I would say, what, six months, maybe? Six months, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good guess on my part. <laughs> and he's been great to have him here. He does really nice work. The patients and the staff really like him. And um, I'm just curious, um, what has been your experience uh, being here at CGH in terms of patients and staff that you've interacted with, Dr. Alzubi? Yeah, from day one, which is beginning of August, I knew that, you know, the, the towns were so welcoming, the staff, the patients, they endorsed and you know, helped me as much as I can succeed uh, and, and meet their, you know, to meet their needs. So I'm really thankful and grateful to all the support that I have received from uh, not just CGH, but the community at large. Yeah, well, hey, it's really good to have you here uh, in town, in our community, as well as on Facebook Live today. And I, I thank you for your time. I know you have more scopes to do today, so I'm going to let you get back at them. But thank you. I just so want much. to say thank you again. And as we get to norm normalcy with, with COVID, which is your next topic, I just want to say one quick sentence. Colorectal cancer is expected to claim the lives of more than 52,000 Americans this year. And that's part of it is because of COVID and putting off screening. So I hope with your help, Dr. Bird and, and uh, other team members, you know, to make that, you know, clear to patients that it's time to kind of make up for the past two years. Well said. Thanks, Dr. Alzubi. Wonderful. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Day. Okay, thanks. I, I see one more question here. Heart, can yes. you see a recurrent, slow, but chronic bleeding control for AVMs and stomach and June? Do the long. Okay, so this, so Julie's talking about people that have little uh, capillaries, I guess you'd say, in their intestinal system that, that bleed intermittently. Um, 
then sometimes that can be related to autoimmune disease. That's a pretty big question. <laughs> I'll let you take a, take a stab at that, Dr. Alzibi, before I let you go. Especially when, when it's deep in the small intestine, unfortunately, medic medicinal treatments has been uh, not so effective in treating those AVMs. So I have to say the, the best uh, strategy would be to ablate those. So uh, we go after those with a type of gas called argon ga plasma, basically a non-touch. We're not touching those. We're just coagulating them with uh, this type of, uh, of uh, uh, cavity, if you will. Um, but they are they're deep in the jejunum. Uh, you know, usually we send patients to a higher level because they have something that is not available in community centers, only in advanced centers where they go into the jejunum. Special type of scope that goes deep into the jejunum mm -hmm. uh, to, yeah. to ablate them. But the answer is very difficult, you know, to uh, treat them with just medicines. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Uh, thank you for your doctor, your answer, Dr. Alzubi, and great having you on the program. Wonderful. Take care. Have a nice day. All, right. All right. Thanks. Thank okay. Uh, so getting into the pandemic, and as we're kind of hopefully winding down, Matt's going to show you our, our graph for this week. Okay. Yeah. So 63 cases. That's 63 cases per 100,000. That's nice. I love those numbers. Positivity rate looks nice. Um, we continue to have folks who do pass away um, from from COVID, so there's still that going on. Yeah, so I wanted to show that. And like in the state of Illinois, I was looking at some numbers, and where are we at here? I think I saw today we're a little under 600, I think, for hospitalized patients with COVID. Um, and that compares to 4,400 at the peak of this last surge. So that's good. We are seeing, uh, and, and you know, our the number of, of COVID positive patients every day is I think 31,000 right now, which is down 43% from the last 14 days. So that looks really good. We are seeing in the U.S. they do in wastewater treatment plants. They're checking to see if there's COVID in the in the uh, sewage, and 38% uh, of the sewage plants that, that they test, and mo most of those are I, I understand are in the Midwest and Northeast about 38% of those plants have had an increase in uh, the amount of, of virus in the sewage. And of course, you know, Europe is having an uptick um, in some other places in the world right now. We do tend to follow Europe a little bit. The good, the good thing about the European situation is yes, there's an uptick in cases, but so far from what I'm reading, there doesn't seem to be an uptick in hospitalizations. Uh, for instance, in Germany, there are 247 cases per 100,000 people right now. UK is 115 per 100,000. In the US, we're at 9.4 per 100,000. So, you know, we're going to see if we have, I, I, would I be surprised if this BA2 causes a little surge, some type of surge here in the US? No, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but we'll see. Not sure, you know, there's a lot of variables about our country that are a little different than other countries. And so time will tell. Right now, at least, things are pretty good in, in our area. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Illinois looks pretty good. Like I've been saying, and like I'll, uh, this is what I would just say is if you're someone who doesn't have a pretty high risk of if you got sick, you could get really sick from, from COVID then I think to follow the CDC's and IDPH's recommendations for what you, how you go about doing things is very appropriate right now. If you are someone who is at higher risk of getting really sick, let's say you're on certain types of chemotherapy, you have a solid organ transplant, um, you know, you're above the age of 65 with multiple medical conditions, I still think it would be reasonable for, that's about 7 million people in the U.S., by the way, I still think it'd be reasonable if you're in a public space to wear a KN95 or N95 mask. But that's your call. You know, everybody has to make that decision for themselves. So those that's just wanted to highlight that again. I, at CGH, just specific to CGH, and then I, I'll be done with my pandemic information. 
we if you if you start if you come to CGH now you'll notice that the screeners in the front the people screeners we don't have those now given the number of cases in our community so if you come in there's going to be signage that's going to say hey you got to wear a mask when you come in to any of our facilities and we'll have masks there for you if you don't have one and we're going to say if you have this list of, any of this list of symptom symptoms uh, turn around and, and come back another day, <laughs> unless you're going to go to the emergency department already care for, for treatment. But that's, that's the, the adjustments we've made uh, here at the hospital to try to kind of navigate as things look better and allowing more freedom of movement within, um, within CGH. Okay. Carrie's asking, is the new B variant that they said was hitting Hong, hitting Hong Kong and Illinois yet? Yep, it is, Carrie. I didn't look at terms of what I saw. I saw something today, something that I get that talked about the percentage of that B2 variant in all the, in all, all the U.S. states and what percentage they are in each state. I, I be honest with you, I didn't look closely to see what Illinois' percentage was, but there is a, yeah, a percentage of Illinois' case, cases are, are these, this B2 variant. Uh, Moderna. I know they're doing Pfizer to the immunocompromised. So, so like if you're uh, Pfizer and you are, you've had your booster shot, and I think if you've gone another five or six months, I'm pretty sure we're doing boosters for those folks who are really high risk. I'm not sure about Moderna, and and if you, I, I would guess if you Google Moderna's site that they would have information about that. We also do have a a vaccine clinic at the main clinic here that's open on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And Carrie, if you were to, I think Carrie asked that question. Uh, if you were to call the main clinic at 815-625-0400 and ask for the vaccine clinic at the main clinic, you could ask them and they can give you more information about what they're doing there with that. I do think it's pretty likely though that at some point in time that kind of like we do for flu, that there'll be booster shots that we'll have on an intermittent basis, just based upon the, the variants of COVID that are circulating around. That's just my guess, but I, 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 I my mind is trending in the, in the direction that that's going to be a likelihood at some point in time for everybody who wants, who wants them. Okay. Well, I've gone a little longer than I was planning. Oh, um, Oh, okay, there you go. So Julie did. Uh, that's your answer. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Appreciate you, you uh, chiming in there. Next week, looking forward to it. Uh, not necessarily the situation that we're going to talk about, but I'm looking forward to having this guest. It's going to be uh, Jay Reeder, Dr. Jay Reeder, who is a family practice doc out at the Lynn Boulevard and also has been very involved in palliative care and hospice care for virtually his entire career uh, in the area here. And so we're going to have him on and we're going to talk about palliative care and hospice care and ask uh, Dr. Reeder to give his uh, perspective on that and, and expertise. And of course, we'll take any questions that you have about that topic. So until then, I thank you so much for taking the time to, to tune in and watch and for your questions. And I hope you have a great week and we'll be back next week to broadcast again. Thank you.